Okay, so let's move towards um, shellfish. Um, now we have Patrick Cahill, also from Goldman Institute, who's going to be speaking from his side of things. Please, let me get this one up. Yeah, so um, I guess Lauren set the scene pretty well for what we do at Cawthron, and this is the highly related to what Lawrence talked about, but um, this is our work with the New Zealand shellfish aquaculture industry. Um, and so I, I think I should acknowledge my co-authors on this. I'm presenting quite a few pieces of work that, that's done variably by quite a few people, and I'm going to rapidly go through quite a few things. Um, so, so Lauren and Ian, who are here, are key people in this project, and also Javier and uh, Sean and Grant at Cawthron. And there's also people that came before us. This has um, been an ongoing piece of work at Cawthron for probably uh, 20 years. It's been a, sort of a cornerstone of Cawthron's biosecurity team. So there's been quite a few people um, building work in this space around supporting New Zealand shellfish aquaculture industry. Um, and just really briefly, some, some background to New Zealand shellfish aquaculture industry. So um, we have a shellfish aquaculture industry that's dominated by the green shell mussel. So this is an endemic species to New Zealand, the Puna canaliculus. Um, and we grow it um, on, I would say, what is a relatively industrial scale for shellfish farming. So we have this continuous um, dropper system of these farms. They're located around the, around the country. Uh, the primary region is Marlborough Sound, which is close to Nelson where we work, so that's quite convenient, and most of the work we do is in the Marlborough Sound. And the industry for green shell mussels is about 350 million per annum currently. Um, and I think that's going to continue to grow. Lauren talked about the moves to open ocean aquaculture um, and the New Zealand aquaculture strategy was just recently uh, released and, and we now have the target of a $3.5 billion industry by 2035. So that, that, that indicates a lot of expansion and I'd suggest that the green shell mussel will continue to play a big role in that. Um, and the other shellfish worth mentioning is the oyster industry. So we do have an oyster industry um, it's quite small compared to um, the green shell mussel industry. Um, currently we're farming Pacific oysters. We, until very recently, had a flat oyster fishery as well, but um, not at the current day. <laughs> and just to sort of more broadly frame this research that we're doing, so it's done um, under what is called the Strategic Science Investment Fund. So the New Zealand government um, puts aside some money to specific institutions to provide that to support underpinning research that's um, deemed um, fundamental to the future of New Zealand's economy, environment and well-being. And this is all really based off Cawthron's uh, pioneering work in shellfish aquaculture. So this is the Cawthron Aquaculture Park, um, which has developed over the years from what was a very small uh, facility to now quite a big facility and we have a lot of industry partners on site. We have the world's largest mus mussel hatchery on site, which is uh, co-development with industry using Cawthron developed technology and we also have oyster breeding facilities and we maintain a strong research um, facility and focus there as well. And in our strategic science investment fund we have some overall goals so and remit, so growing the existing shellfish industry um, enabling new shellfish aquaculture industries and securing the current shellfish aquaculture production. And our work on biofouling really falls in the, the last theme, so it's around managing biofouling, which is seen as, or is, a, a real risk to production of shellfish today. Um, so in terms of biofouling in, in shellfish, in mussel farming, particularly in New Zealand, so we're talking here about marine pests, I guess there was some talk yesterday about the terms of invasive species, marine pests. I think aquaculture is the, probably the clearest example of where the term marine pest um, is appropriate. Um, it's, we're talking, it's very similar to agriculture and we're, look, we're looking to control pests that are impacting on production of a primary industry. Um, and maybe unlike some of the, most of the talks today, to date in this forum, um, this can include both exotic and native species, can be pests in, in aquaculture. I would say it would be fair to say that exotic species are massively overrepresented though when you look at um, species that are impacting uh, uh, aquaculture, uh, shellfish aquaculture and there's 
some scary pictures of uh, some of the pests that you can get in these are all New Zealand green shell mussel farms or except one there's Lauren Sardinum picture but um, so tunicates are a big thing um, there's seaweed um, and I think in New Zealand it's quite an unusual situation that the number one fouling pest is the blue mussel so this is the mussel that most people are farming in other places around the world um, and the species overgrows and outcompetes um, our green shell mussel, which is the species we want to grow. So um, we actually put quite a bit of effort into controlling um, this species. Um, and these species, these pictures sort of show that there's quite different fouling, and I think that's representative that these impacts and effects are quite variable. They're hard to predict and they're hard to manage. And there's also some synergies of operational management and biosecurity, so maintaining these, these kind of pests below problematic thresholds um, is important for maintaining productivity of farms, but it also has the benefit of improved biosecurity when these things might be invasive species growing on uh, aquaculture structures acting as hubs or maybe associated with movements of um, crop. And, and one part of the mussel aquaculture grow out cycle that's particularly uh, impacted um, is the early grow out stage so we have a variable way of, of seeding mussels onto lines which I won't go into but we have very very low spat retention so um, people put little baby mussels on a rope and if you're doing very well you might retain 10% of them so and that's quite variable you can get no retention but you can see you're, we're losing a lot of mussels and even small improvements in that um, can lead to big financial gains um, and the industry sees that biofouling is at, very, at the very least um, confounding that problem. Most industry people will tell you that biofouling is a problem for spat retention um, and, spat, and these biofouling pests can also impact the later crop stages, um, they can smother, compete, I think Nina overviewed um, generally the, the types of impacts um, these pests can have. Um, so our specific research remit in here is to in our program is to develop tools um, and understanding to enable proactive management of risks to aquaculture production from biofouling. So I guess that's quite self-explanatory. Um, and you I mean you can look in the literature and there, there's a heap of literature in the space from from both New Zealand and around the world. And people have done a lot of things and they work very they work in, in some contexts and not others and it's Again, it's a hard to predict and manage problem. So what we're trying to build towards through the research we're doing is this concept of integrated pest management, which is something that's used uh, quite widely in terrestrial agriculture. So it's, it's really using ecology to, to drive management decisions of a pest. So if we can understand how um, a pest interacts with a, a culture animal and the environment um, and thresholds for, for economic and ecological harm, then we can use a toolbox of tools in, a, in an optimal way um, to get the best um, outcomes of, for, for both industry and, and the environment. So this is the kind of framework that we're, we're broadly thinking towards um, in overall. And some of the key bits of research that we're doing that are responding to those key components in that kind of framework that I'll sort of skim through some of the research we're doing fall into these broad categories. So a key is, as I mentioned, generating ecological knowledge of your pest, how it interacts in the environment, interacts in your farming system. Um, and we're working on this functional group concept, which I'll describe briefly. Um, we're working on some concepts of simple industry monitoring. So industry need to generate data um, if we want to, to of, of how pests are proliferating, um, if we want to uh, direct management um, in that, this kind of way. Um, then we're also looking at proactive tools to prevent or avoid proliferation, which I would say is the most, mm, we should proactively try to stop things as a, as a first option, but then sometimes that doesn't work, so we're also doing some work on reactive tools when pests do go over a certain level. Um, so yeah, I mentioned this uh, concept of functional groups of pests, so there's a lot of pests biofouling pests that can imp impact on aquaculture. It's hard to predict and manage, um, and a pest that's a pest somewhere may not be a pest somewhere else, and vice versa. So um, instead of looking at specific taxa 
um, we're sort of going towards this concept of functional groups, so looking at what are the main classes of uh, biofouling organisms, um, how do they impact uh, on aquaculture, and then how can we derive sort of standardised management approaches that farmers can use um, in the real world. Um, and this is sort of the kind of thinking we're going through, and these are sort of the come of some of the impact categories. And it's not intended to read this, but um, sort of looking at this functional group concept, but more some of the types of taxonomic groups, um, how they impact, when in the production stage they're impacting, and then maybe some of the species that we could look at a bit closer as model organisms to try and extrapolate some of these things. Um, so a specific bit of work we've, uh, we've done is around with this functional group concept is looking at how some of these taxa are distributed around farms, um, specifically at, um, how they grow on farms versus the natural environment um, adjacent to, distant to farms um, with the concept that farms may be acting as propagule or hubs and you could use this information if you have pests that, I guess, uh, rely on a farm to be there to be there. Um, if you did something like fallow the farm, you may be able to get rid of that pest. Um, it's not there when you put the farm back in, um, and then you get a window of, of improved production concepts like this. So there was a relatively extensive survey done throughout the Marlborough Sounds looking at um, some of these key pests that we identified that fall into these kind of functional groups. Um, I won't go into the detail, but you could see um, overall there's, it, it differs between pests, I guess, as you expect, and to just look at a couple, so Cyonid, um, the sea squirt, um, you basically only find it on a farm, so, um, and that's across seasons as well, so this concept of fallowing um, or spacing farms out could work in that situation, but there's things like blue mussel, which I said was a really big problem. Um, it's everywhere, so I guess that kind of concept wouldn't work as well, but, but yeah, so we can dive deeper into that, but I'm just skimming over it here. Um, and then we're also doing some work on impacts, um, so there's, there's, there's quite a lot of information out there. Um, we don't want to redo things that have already been done, so we've been doing the literature review to, um, to identify what is known specific to shellfish aquaculture in terms of impacts of the different uh, functional groups, um, and then we're targeting some experiments to fill the gaps. Um, and so some experiments we're thinking towards the space competition, so things like um, bubble weed versus spat, um, feeding competition, so size filtering dist distribution and looking specifically at some high profile marine invaders, um, predation, which I guess slightly falls out of the biofouling remit, but um, we're quite interested. There's these uh, large predatory flatworms that seem to be emerging as a problem and uh, they basically get inside the mussel and eat it, so we're doing some work on them. Um, and then there's other things around uh, operational problems from specific uh, different fouling organisms. Um, yeah. And then, so Ian has also been doing work on this concept of an industry monitoring protocol. So he's developed this sort of conceptual industry monitoring framework that could fit in with this idealised, or this is, I guess, the standard way that they farm, so there's some set interventions that the farmers do and it provides an opportunity to monitor and, and look at how pests are proliferating um, and get this kind of baseline data that you need. Um, so there's been some, some uh, conceptual work done around detection efficiency of pests and um, probability of detection if you monitor in a certain way at these different production stages. Um, and this has, I guess, joint benefits of helping direct management but also um, uh, act as a surveillance mechanism as well, so I think that's key for industry as well. Um, and the, the plan is to validate some of these things in the field, so using both traditional and novel approaches. Um, yeah, so that's going to be happening this summer to, to see what we have, and we're going to do that with the industry so that we make something that's realistic that they can actually use and want to use, which is often a key uh, challenge. Um, so Quickly going over, so we're and now looking at some of the proactive tools we have, I guess this links back to some of the earlier distribution work we have. So um, Javier Atala has been developing these series of um, 
proactive, I guess, spatial management tools um, for key fouling pests. So basically modelling the distribution um, or how, how pests proliferate on farms. And he's had access to this really great um, data database produced by the Marine Farming Association on oversettlement of the blue mussel, which I said was one of the key fouling pests. And he's made this interactive hind casting and forecasting app, which a farmer can go on. They can look at their farm. They can uh, look when they would deploy their lines and see the likelihood if they're going to um, get a big oversettlement of blue mussels. Um, so then they can time their, man their farming activities um, to avoid those kind of problems. And they're, they're using this tool, and, and, we, and we get quite good feedback from it. I think it's been quite successful. And so that's currently be extended out also to green mussel settlements. So you can target times when you will get green mussels, but not blue mussels. Um, yeah. And you can go on these links and you can see, see these apps. Um, and then linking back to that work I mentioned around uh, distributions of pests in the sound. So we're currently using some particle tracking models developed at Cawthron, inputting that data of pest distributions. Um, to look at how uh, the, these pests could move between farms and again using that for management interventions, things like fire breaks, fallowing. Um, yeah. uh, another proactive tool we're looking at, so there's this really common practice in industry called subbing, so they basically uh, know that particularly the blue mussels settle high in the water column, so they drop their lines down low um, to get away from the blue mussels. This is done quite uh, a lot. Uh, but and so we've got some work with the industry um, quantifying does this actually work, what are the best parameters to do it, um, and so that we, they can optimise that process and then feed it back in with these other sort of spatial management tools that we're using. And there's also interest, if you do that, then you have this big <coughs> deal, empty space of water column above um, where it's sort of suitable for growing seaweeds um, and Undaria pinnatifida already grows in, in that area, so the industry is looking towards um, this concept of subbing and then growing Undaria in that top part of the water column and the time frames for that, those kind of processes line up very well. So it's obviously an invasive species. There is some, there is ability to farm this in New Zealand that hasn't been done yet, but we've been working with the industry to um, help them or to see what, how is this possible, what are the biosecurity considerations and how can we um, make them happen. So I guess it's quite a nice concept of working with nature um, rather than against it. Uh, then some pr another random proactive tool we're developing. So mussel farmers are reusing these mussel ropes all the time. They, they pose a biosecurity risk. They're moving them between regions and regions. Uh, also pose a disease risk um, and they're also more likely to be fouled because they contain cues from the previous fouling. So we're working with, with one of the mussel companies. They already do this process to, to condition the ropes. Um, and we're helping them develop a heat treatment tool to sterilize the ropes as well to, to de-risk them. Um, so we've had this machine built that we're currently testing. It's basically a heat treatment um, system that will slot into their current process. And we're working to validate the parameters that we apply um, and are they effective. Um, so making a standardized approach that they can use for better biosecurity. Um, and we've also got a lot of other proactive research, or proactive tools, more techie stuff happening at Quarthron. It sort of falls slightly outside of this, but we see uh, aquaculture as an application for, a primary application for some of the more novel anti-fouling stuff we're doing. I talked at detail about the one on the right the other day, but we're doing some other stuff with bubble streams. I think Sarah Strong mentioned that, and then we have some things around fouling resistant mussel floats, fouling resistant mussel socking, um, that's producing, um, so it sort of all feeds into the same goals. Um, and then the final one I'll talk about was reactive tools. So I said if you, there's always maybe a need to reactively treat fouling if it goes over a threshold. So there's been a lot of work in this space um, and we've just really been trying to operationalize something. Um, and we've been working on acetic acid, so it's quite simple. It's vinegar, it's uh, dipping, dipping mussels in vinegar. Um, and we've had some really great results, sort of better than we would have expected. So this is actually mussel bags on the left that, uh, so you can see you dip it in uh, acetic acid and it's at the concentration lower than household vinegar. So it's quite environmentally benign. You kill all the fouling 
um, and the mussel farmers are actually using that. Um, and we've extended that out into mussels as well. So this is very briefly the results of some of the things we've done. So uh, I mentioned that spat was particularly prone to fouling. Um, so this is work we did dipping spat that had been deployed and we knew we know sort of roughly when fouling starts to become a problem and then we did a single we do a single acetic acid dip and for ver this is trialing various times and concentrations but basically the high bars are at a certain time over a certain concentration we get pretty significantly improved spat retention there's about 60 percent more muscles on the ropes they end up being slightly smaller because there's so many more that they space space competition and so we've repeated this a couple of times and it's actually worked consistently and we're currently working with the agriculture company to scale it up. There's some challenge in doing this on the scale of a New Zealand mussel farm but, but they are quite interested in it. And yeah, so there's maybe a range of projects there that I skimmed over very quickly but again we're sort of working towards this overall framework of applying these things um, and this concept of integrated pest management um, and so just briefly how we sort of see that in shellfish aquaculture again it's got ecology on the outside how pests um, and shellfish interact um, it's got economics and it's got environment um, under that um, and sort of thresholds that you need to maintain things under and then it has the tools that we're trying to develop so it has monitoring um, it has proactive management and it has reactive management and those things need to be applied based on data so that's the kind of framework we're hoping to work towards and then I'll just acknowledge um, our industry partners so we work very closely with mussel farmers on these projects so these are some of the key mussel farming companies that we work with and the key industry bodies do support us as well.